Hi there. My name is Aaron Landerman. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech. And here in this lecture of guitar amplification and effects, we will continue our study of cathode followers, in particular practical ones that involve self-bias schemes. In the last lecture, I showed you a bias scheme that looked like something on the left. And I showed you this because it matched the kind of bias scheme that we typically used for common cathode amplifiers. Unfortunately, in practice, this scheme doesn't lend itself to making a very good cathode follower. Ultimately, it's impossible to try to coordinate the various trade-offs that it forces you to make in a satisfying fashion. Lacking anything better to call it, I call this the naive self-bias scheme because it's the first thing you might try before realizing it's not going to work very well and you need to tweak it somehow to make it work better. One way to handle this is to take the cathode resistance and split it into two parts. And I probably wasted half an hour of my life thinking about how I wanted to notate this. A lot of books will call this here RK. And I really want to call this entire resistance here RK. So I decided to call this RK prime. RT down here, you might think of that as a tail resistance. Now, this RG is our grid leak resistor. It provides a DC path to ground for any electrons that wind up building up on the grid that aren't supposed to be there. But by connecting the grid leak resistor to this point instead of ground, it means we can now basically teleport the voltage that's here up here in the DC bias scheme. Remember when we're computing DC bias points, we open up this capacitor so if we assume that there's no current flowing through the grid, there's no place for those electrons to go. So the voltage that you see here is the voltage you see here. So our K prime here can be chosen to decide the grid to cathode voltage. But we still have this RT here that we can use to adjust the load line, which is particularly useful in most cathode followers where this load resistance up here is actually zero, and RT is essentially playing the role of that load resistance setting the load line. Now, there are situations where you have a circuit where you do have this RL up here. Those tend to be cathodyne phase inverters. That's a case where you'll take the output from down here, but you'll also take the output from up here with the plate, and these two will be out of phase, and that's something we'll look at later. Notice that there are two places you can take the output from. I'm mostly going to be talking about taking the output from the cathode directly. Some folks will take it out of the junction between this RK prime and RT. Usually RT is much, 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 much bigger than RK prime. So you don't get a lot of loss through this voltage divider. And I should also mention that I'm ignoring RG in that discussion because this RG is much, 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 much bigger than RT. So we can basically ignore it while computing things like small signal gain and output impedances. And from what I've read, people use this alternative output if they have issues with stability. So something that we'll talk about a little bit later in the course, but is mostly out of the scope of this class, is that tubes will have parasitic capacitances. These are a big deal if you're building RF circuits. They're less of a deal for audio circuits, but they do play a role. And you can get into situations where that parasitic capacitances causes instabilities, and there's unwanted feedback that causes this to turn into an oscillator. That's a very, 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 very bad thing. Apparently, if you take the output from here instead of up here, it can help with some of those oscillation issues. But most of the examples I've been looking at lately, at least, seem to just take the output from here and don't have any problem with it. Anyway, we will look at both of these output types. Now, for the common cathode stages we've been looking at and for this naive self-bias scheme, the input resistance was just RG. It's just a resistor to ground. The input impedance of this circuit here is actually a lot higher than RG. Since this is a buffer, you basically have the input voltage here being copied almost identically, although not quite because it is going through this voltage divider. And also this buffer itself isn't perfect. There's going to be a little loss through the buffer. As we saw last time, this doesn't have exact unity gain. 
but it's going to be a voltage that's pretty close. So you have a voltage here, a voltage that's very close to it. So there's not really a big voltage difference between these two nodes, meaning there's not a lot of current flowing through this resistor. And the net effect of that is if you think about computing the Thevenin resistance looking in this way, what you have is a case where you have whatever voltage you have and a very, very, very small current. So when you divide that voltage by that very, very, very small current, you get a big resistance. This kind of trick is called bootstrapping. The details of it are beyond the scope of what I want to talk about in this class. I would encourage you to investigate that on your own. The main thing to know here is just the input impedance is really big. It's much bigger than this RG, and RG itself is usually very big. So this overall makes an excellent voltage buffer. Very high input impedance, very low output impedance. Now, one thing to note in this particular bias scheme, there's not a lot of voltage dropped across here. There's typically a very big voltage here, which means that there's a very big DC bias voltage here. So here we have to explicitly have an AC coupling cap to separate the signal out here in the world that is usually referenced to ground or however it is referenced from the reference at this point, which is going to be pretty big. I'm going to define RK as the sum of RK prime and RT, and that will let me use RK in the various formulas we computed in the previous lecture. Nobody actually uses this self-bias scheme, so this thing on the right here is just called a self-bias cathode follower. But if I had to give it a name, you might call it something like a split cathode bootstrap self-bias, something like that. I don't know. Somebody out there may have called it that, but I think I just made that up. So let's look at a particular example, and I'm going to use the Dumble later, part of an effects loop scheme that was developed by Alexander Dumble for his amplifiers. In the realm of mystique of amplifiers, no amplifiers are more coveted or have a greater air of mystery around them than those created by Alexander Dumble. If you're curious about this, I strongly recommend checking out the video by Rhett Scholl on Dumble amplifiers. So a guitar amp has a preamp stage whose job it is to take the small voltage from your guitar pickups, amplify them into a bigger voltage, and then a power amp stage that we'll look at later in the class whose job it is to take that bigger voltage and actually turn it into a current that you can drive speakers with. The idea of an effects loop is that you can put some external processing in between the preamp and power amp stages. So the signal comes from the preamp it gets buffered by this cathode follower here. It gets sent out to your pedals, then it gets processed by your phasers or your flangers or your chorus pedals or your reverbs or delays or whatever. And then it comes back from the outside world into the amp. And in this case, Dumble is using a common cathode stage like what we've looked at in previous lectures. And then that signal gets sent to the power amp. Notice that we have volume controls on both the return and the send. And very interestingly, there's a treble bleed capacitor here. So this is something that is used on some guitars, on the volume pots on guitars, hooked between the incoming signal and the wiper that's the output of the volume pot. Here it's being used on the dumbbellator. So there you go. I haven't explicitly drawn it in the previous schematics, but there's usually an AC coupling capacitor. And notice you would really not want this to fail as a short because then you would be sending a very big DC voltage out to your fragile pedals. So important work this capacitor is doing here. Let's see, and there's a trouble bleed on the return volume pot too. Oh, there's also switches. So these trouble bleeds are optional. The trouble bleed is something I had my Georgia Tech students analyze on a homework assignment. So let's dig into this cathode follower. We have the coupling cap at the input. We have this coupling cap at the output. I'm not going to worry about analyzing all of this stuff out here. It's fairly standard. We have a grid resistor of 1 mega ohm. Again, because of bootstrapping, the actual input impedance is a lot higher. Here we have RK of 1.5 kilo ohm and a tail resistance of 10 kilo ohm. And I've guessed that the plate voltage here from the power supply is 300 volts. I don't know for a fact that that's the case. That's what I picked up from reading various web forums. So who knows? Let's assume it's 300 volts and have some fun. <laughs> 
So in this instance, RK is 11.5 kilo ohms. So to draw a DC load line, we can place a point on the horizontal axis of 300 volts. That's where there's no current, so there's no voltage dropping across RK. So all of the voltage is dropping across the triode. At the other extreme, where we assume that no voltage is dropping across the triode, all of the 300 volts are dropping across this 11.5 kilo ohm resistor, giving us a current of 26.1 milliamps. That gives us a problem, though, because that's way above any point we actually have on the graph. So we have to just pick another point somewhere. So how about 2 milliamps? So if we assume that we have 300 volts, but we're losing 2 milliamps times 11.5 kilo ohms across the resistor, that will correspond to a voltage of 277 volts. So I now have two points. One of my points is at a current of 2 milliamps and a voltage of 277 volts. The other point is at 300 volts. So if I draw a line between these two points, I wind up with something that looks like this. So notice this is a lot steeper than the lines we drew for common cathode amps, and that's because the overall resistance is a lot lower here. Now we can draw some grid lines, and now remember the voltage difference between the grid and the cathode is being defined by this 1.5k resistance. So let's try some values. I'm going to try VGK values of minus 2 and minus 2.5 volts. I'm trying those because I've already done this analysis and I know those are going to work. Occasionally you'll try some other pairs and you'll wind up with something that doesn't work and you get lines that don't cross. So you just got to try some others. So dividing 2 volts by 1.5 kilo ohms gives me 1.3 milliamps. Dividing 2.5 volts by 1.5 kilo ohms gives me 1.67 milliamps. That gives me my points to plot. I have one point that is 1.3 milliamps intersecting this minus 2 volts curve for the gate to cathode voltage. And then I have a 1.67 milliamp line intersecting the minus 2.5 volt grid to cathode voltage line. So I can now draw a grid line connecting those two points look at where my grid line and my load line intersect, and I see that they intersect at a current of 1.45 milliamps and a plate to cathode voltage of 285 volts. It looks like the bias point for the grid to cathode voltage is gonna be around minus 2.2 volts or something like that. So we can use this 1.45 milliamp value and this 285 volt value to do a bit of sanity checking. So that's where our lines intersected on the graph. And if I think about the voltages computed with what we read off the vertical axis there, well, if I take that 1.45 and multiply it by 1.5, stick a minus sign in front to be pedantic, I wind up with minus 2.17 volts for my grid to cathode voltage. That's the drop across that resistance. And that matches more or less what we saw on the graph. Also, if I take 300 volts and subtract that current that we measured times our RK prime, I wind up with 283 volts, which is more or less what we measured off the graph by looking at the horizontal axis. So everything squares. The main point of all of this is to get this 1.45 milliamp value. So I can go look up these small signal parameters on the 12AX7 data sheet. So here we have 1.45 on the horizontal axis. And if we take a look at where that intersects, oh, look, mu is 100. That's not exactly surprising. Let's see where it intersects the RP plate resistance line. Let's see, it intersects it at 58 kilo ohms. So to compute the small signal gain, I can just plug those numbers into the formula we derived in the last lecture giving me 0 0.943. So this is pretty close to 1. This 58 kilo ohm quantity here is negligible compared to this 101 times 11.5 kilo ohm. So this is a pretty good thing. We can similarly just plug in values for the expression we computed in the last lecture for the output impedance. 
This gives me 58 kilo ohms over 101 in parallel with 11.5 kilo ohm. And it's this magical division by 101 that makes the output impedance so amazing. You get a very small quantity here, and basically this in parallel is relatively irrelevant. And just look at how wonderfully low that output impedance is. Isn't that glorious? Anyway, one other thing I wanted to mention is that if we did have an RL, it would show up here. But it's zero in this particular instance, so we don't need to worry about it. So I mentioned earlier that in addition to taking the output here, you could take the output from here. And basically, to compute the gain associated with this alternate output, we can take the gain we just computed and just apply this voltage divider. Here, the denominator is RK prime plus RT. I would like to remind you that we're assuming that RG is really, really big relative to RK prime and RT, so we can neglect it in our analysis. Now, if I go ahead and plug in that expression for A, notice that the RK in the numerator here cancels with this RK in the denominator, and I get this expression, which looks like my original expression for A, except in the numerator I have RT replacing RK. Now, suppose that we hadn't previously computed A. We could compute A alt directly by using the kind of approach we had previously, where we said, okay, the raw gain from the triode is mu over mu plus one, and then I have to deal with a voltage divider, where the voltage is being divided over RT, so that goes in the numerator, and then I have the series voltage where, looking up in the triode, I have RP divided by mu plus one, and that's associated with the Thevenin equivalent looking into the cathode, and RK, which is all of this stuff in series. And just a little bit of algebra on this expression, if I multiply mu plus one through, I wind up with this term when I multiply it by RK, and then they wind up canceling in that last term giving me RP. So these are just two different ways of viewing the same quantity. So computing the output impedance for this alternate output, again, we're assuming that RG is so big we don't need to worry about it. Well, I have RT in parallel with the resistance seen looking up this direction, which is RK prime plus that little RP over mu plus one. Now, if you want, you can take the various quantities we computed for the dumbbellator, plug them into the expression for A alt here, and plug them into the expression for R out here, and see what the small signal gain and output impedance is for this output instead of this output. I don't actually recommend that you bother doing that because the answers don't differ very much. Before we wrap up our discussion, I want to talk about what happens for very large mu. Consider this raw primitive version of the gain formula. If mu is big, this mu over mu plus one factor is approximately one, and this rp over mu plus one is approximately rp over mu. Now, remember rp, mu, and the transconductance gm that we haven't really been using much, at least not directly, are all related. rp over mu is equal to one over gm. So if mu is large, in one sense, it can disappear from the gain expression, and we only really need one quantity, which is the transconductance gain. Similarly, if we take a look at the output impedance, if mu is large, mu plus one is approximately mu, I can replace RP over mu with one over GM, and again, the only quantity we need here is that transconductance gain. I just thought that was interesting.